You came back. I'm glad. Don't you love what happens here? Uh, um, this is this experience of being together in church is um, it's the best time of the week because God meets with His people. He hears us and speaks to us. There's so many places where gatherings happen around this community where the sense of the presence of God is not the same. And we're here really drawing near to Him, wanting to hear Him speak to us, and I'm, I'm thankful for uh, Tom and the team leading us to think about giving to God our praise. Forget none of His benefits. I wonder if you were sitting there and you thought to yourself for a moment, um, I'd like to give thanks for a benefit that God has given to me. Would anybody want to speak in church and tell of the benefit of God that you were thinking about? The friends you have. Great. Thank you, Jan. Anybody else? The benefits of God. Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the body of Christ has been phenomenal in your lives. Mark. Best life insurance plan in the universe. Okay, I want you to keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. Elsie? Beauty of creation. The beauty of creation. Great. The benefits of God. Diana? His joy and his peace. His joy and his peace. I'm glad that you have that. Yes? The fact I'm sitting here today. That you're here today. That's good. That you're here today. A lot of us have had a different path. God changed the path, and here we want to be in the house of God. That's a change in our hearts. Okay. One or two more? Okay, the community we have in the times that are good and the times that are hard. Oh, yeah. Family and siblings. Great. Okay, good. Yes. I can't hear you. Take your mask off. No, I'm just kidding. What, what do you say? Answers to prayer. How many have had answers to prayer? Okay. All right. What happens here in this room is unique. Not because of us, but because of our purpose to be with God and He's with us. And I really think that what has happened over the last several weeks and we've been together, we've sensed God with us as we've opened His Word, we've listened to Him. Uh, last week, if you didn't hear the message, there was a really strong word to us about the way in which we live in light of the truth that we know. And I would commend that to you. Um, today... In the ongoing study in the book of Hebrews, there's a warning. A warning. And it's an urgent warning and a blessing wrapped in it. We have warnings in our life all over the place. Warnings when we drive, there are flashing lights, hopefully only in front of us, not behind us. <laughs> There are, are warnings uh, when you come to a, a railroad crossing. That's a warning that you take seriously. Um, you have weather warnings when there's a, a tornado or um, a flash flood and you're paying attention. A lot of times you can get sort of accustomed to warnings and sort of brush them off. There's a warning on your mattress that you shouldn't take the label off. <laughs> that probably doesn't scare you that much. Warnings are all over the place. Um, I mean, we're living in a day in the health area where we're getting warnings all over the 
place. And we can get accustomed to them and then stop listening to them at the same level of urgency. You know what I mean? But when God gives a warning and God says, you you should pay close attention to this, it's to your harm to not pay attention to it. So when I say the passage today has a warning, um, it's a warning not, not to pay attention to your own peril. It will be bad for you not to listen to what God says in His Word. So if you have your Bible, let's open together to uh, the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. We listen carefully to warnings because warnings help us avert danger. And when we listen carefully to God and take Him seriously, the result is blessing. And this passage is about entering into God's blessing and His rest, and um, it's the warning of, of how your life will be ruined now and for eternity if you reject what God has said. So how serious a warning is this? Pretty intense? It's worth listening to. And the context of the warning comes to a group of people who had been very familiar with the things of God and His warning, like many of you. If you come to church all the time, you're in danger today of just being acclimated to these things, but they're just in your head and maybe not in your heart. There's a warning that we might listen to this again and again and again, but never personally appropriate these things for our own lives. And this is the warning that's being given to this context. In order to begin, we have to read chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 to get to verse 1 of chapter 4. And again, it's a reminder that the people of Israel who wandered in the wilderness, they were the wilderness generation who rebelled against God, and therefore they didn't enter into the land of Canaan. Verse 18 says, and to whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the writer's summary statement of the rebellious generation of 1500 B.C., Jewish people wandering in the wilderness, not entering the land of Canaan because they were disobedient and did not believe God. So a whole generation died in the wilderness, and then Joshua led the new generation into the land. Even Moses didn't enter the land, and they didn't enter into rest. Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, therefore, this is the the first of the so what's, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should be seen to have failed to reach it. The writer of this book is saying to the listeners of this, I want you to pay attention to what happened to them. Because the promise to enter the rest of God still exists, and I'm afraid that some of you might miss it. If he were here today, I think he'd look around this room and said, my concern for you is that some of you who think you know that you're going to enter into God's rest really aren't going to enter into God's rest because you don't know what it takes to enter into his rest. It's a warning. Now, the rest that's described here is complex because there is a a flow in the writer's thinking that the rest includes the people of Israel entering the land of Canaan. And so their rest in 1500 B.C., roughly, was that they entered into the land of promise. But the idea of rest altogether, said in verse 1, entering into God's rest. The idea of rest is basically to cease from work and to cease from all your activity. 
resting is to trust in Him and totally rest in Him altogether. Chiefly, then, it's, it's to rest in God. It's illustrated throughout this text, then, of the Israelites not entering into the land of promise, but in a larger context, he's going to move it, having illustrated, secondly, from God resting on the seventh day and creating a Sabbath for his people, that the real rest he's talking about is entering into the rest of salvation in his son Christ, who is the one who gives eternal rest. It's the end of work and trying to please God. It's resting ultimately in God and His grace that's fully pictured in Christ. He's going to take these 13 verses and talk about what it means to rest in God with these illustrations in history for Israel and God in creation, but drive home the most important part that, that rest is trusting in Him, resting altogether in Him. In the Old Testament, rest was entering the promised land. But it wasn't just the geographic territory. In this illustration, it's Israel entering in the land, but entering into the land whereby Israel was resting in God as their God, King, Savior, Director for everything that would happen in Israel. They were to enter into the land and then let God's rule be over them. So did Israel, after the generation who didn't believe died, and they entered into the land, did they experience the rest that God had promised when they entered the promised land? Anybody? They really didn't. Because when they entered the land, did they obey God and live under His rule? Did they say, we want you to be our king and God? No, it wasn't long before they said to God in the land that was the promised land to be flowing with milk and honey, that this was the rest that God was going to give them there where he would be their God. They said to him, we want a king like all the other nations. We don't really want you to rule over us. We'd like to find an appropriate human being. So did they experience rest in the land? No, not really. And they're pointing forward to a rest that was going to come. They fell short, even though they entered the land. So, in verse three, verse 2 then, it says, um, well, let's, I want to show you one thing. In verse 1. Can we have verse 1 back? Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. This is the writer of Hebrews saying to first century Christians, I'm concerned that you missed this rest, but the offer of rest still stands. In 2021, on this day, I want to say to you, the offer of God to give you eternal rest still stands. That rest that comes by believing in Christ and trusting in Him altogether still stands. And I'm, I want to be sure that you, you get there. I don't want you to miss this warning. Verse 2 now. For the good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Okay, the writer of Hebrews is saying, the good news came to us as it came to them. He's looking back to the people of Israel. They had a good news, but they didn't believe it. The good news of God has come to us too, but it didn't benefit them. Why not? Because they were not united with faith by those who listened. There were two groups of people in Israel, those who believed God and trusted in Him, and those who didn't. So the writer of Hebrews is saying there is this good news that's given. It's the good gospel news. For Israel, it was the news that God was going to be their God. He was going to save them. He was going to bring them into the land. 
And the people of Israel were saved in the exact same way that we're saved today by believing in what God said. The content of what Israel heard is different than the content of what God has told us. It's fuller, it's richer, it's culminated in Christ for us. But the good news came to us as it came to them, but the message they heard didn't benefit it because it wasn't united in their heart by faith. What do you think is going to be the key to receiving this message and this rest? It's going to be faith. It's what God demanded of Israel. Believe and love the Lord your God with all your heart. And did they? Not generally. And so they missed the rest. But this good news has come for both. And the key is going to be united Uniting faith in our hearts with the message. Verse 3, not on the screen, for we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they will not enter rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And again in the passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Now, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 95, and he's referring to God resting, Israel seeking rest, and then missing it because they did not believe. And this is the warning for us. Then that comes to verse 6, verse 6 on the screen. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. Okay. I realize this is a little bit dense, but you can handle this, right? Okay, 65 AD, talking about 1500 BC, not entering rest, quoting a Psalm 95 uh, in about 1000 BC, and then in 65 AD, he says, therefore it remains for some to enter it, like right now in 65 AD, after the death of Christ. It remains possible for some of the people of Israel to enter into this rest that ancient Israel missed. You can still enter in to the rest, even though generations have failed to enter in. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he points a certain day. What day? Today, 65 AD, as the word comes to him, which is quoting Psalm 95, which was a long time ago. But the writer of Hebrews is saying to this audience in the first century, they failed, but there remains some time for you to enter into it. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. This is an urgent reminder What God said in Psalm 95 is today, don't harden your hearts. What God says in 65 AD, don't harden your hearts. What do you think God says in 2021? Don't harden your hearts or you will miss the rest, which is here described as a symbolic picture of God resting on the seventh day, of Israel entering the land of Canaan, and on you entering into rest with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't harden your hearts when God speaks to you. Verse 8 says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God wouldn't have spoken of another day later on through David, saying, another today, later today. You following me on this? Uh, Okay. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for God's people. Ah! There still remains a Sabbath rest for God's people in 65 AD when the writer of Hebrews is writing this, and today for you as you're listening to this, a Sabbath rest where you can rest in God. For whoever has entered into God's rest, let's read that last phrase together, has also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, this is where the writer of Hebrews is taking the concept of rest pictured in entering Cana, pictured in God resting on the seventh day, pictured in the Sabbath rest that was part of the Ten Commandments, to saying the spiritual application 
that there remains a Sabbath rest for God's people, a spiritual rest in God, for whoever has entered into God's rest salvifically being saved has rested from his works as God rested from his. In other words, when you come to see what God has done through his son Jesus Christ, there is an end to all working to gain God and instead a resting in him to receive what he has done through his son Jesus Christ. Do you get that? The rest spiritually, and if I could use that word again, salvifically, in, in the sense of creating salvation, experience salvation is not working and striving for a kind of self-righteous working so God loves me, but a resting in the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of rest. Then you cease from your work and you rest in what God did and that's where rest is available. So do you have the rest of God? Are you at peace with God? This rest is, a, is like, okay, I rest. We think about rest, what does it feel like? I'm going to take a vacation, I'm just going to relax, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, you can do that for a while, but when, when you rest in God and you trust completely in Him, there's the end of all striving and all self-effort and all working so that God will love me, so that God will approve me. The whole message of the grace of God, the good news of God, is that Jesus Christ, described in the first three chapters, is the one that we look to, the one who made purifications for sins, and we rest in Him forever, and there's rest. Okay? Do you have that? The warning is, there's a lot of people in the community who hear it and 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 miss it. What is the connection? The connection is listening and believing. So here you see these words of, of trusting in this, failed to reach it because verse 3 again, verse 2 again, they weren't united with faith. They listened to it but it wasn't united with faith. Listen, the, there remains a Sabbath for God's people because we enter and rest and trust in Him. Um, the Sabbath and the rest we enter in when we trust Christ and no longer have to work. Many people think about the Old Testament and all of this Old Testament history, and we look back on the Old Testament and we say, well, that was all laws, and if people kept the laws, then they were saved. God saved them if they did everything right, but now we have Jesus, and we just have to trust Jesus. Is that the right way to think about the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament? No. We think about the Old Testament, God gave His law, but His law was a protection for them to keep them in the place where they knew God was to be trusted and to be believed. So every Old Testament saint was saved the exact same way any New Testament or 2021 saint is saved, and that is by faith. by faith and the grace of God. That God has said something, done something, and we trust in Him completely there. That's the point of what's happening here. Do you have that rest? Now, it's precisely at this point that many people don't have rest spiritually with God. There are many people who feel like, I've never done enough for God, and I don't know if I had to stand before God and He were to say to you this great diagnostic question, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Would you be able to say to God, I've pretty much outweighed my bads with my goods and I think I'm there, or I've I'm going to list my accomplishments and I know that my entrance into your eternal rest is pretty good because of my qualifications. I went to church. 
on uh, September 26, 2021. Is that it? Or is it, I know what Jesus Christ did for me. I trust in Him. I believe in the good news about Jesus, and I rest in Him completely. That's where it lies, that that's how we trust in Him. Our trusting in God in that moment and it is the only way to ensure eternal rest. And the biggest mistake anyone will ever make is unbelief in what Jesus Christ has done. And it matters. Think the urgent warning lights. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again to give you eternal life? And are you trusting in Him for your eternal rest? It is the only answer. Turn in your Bible left for a minute, and let me turn back to you, with you, to Romans chapter 5, and let me just show a verse to you from Romans chapter 5. It's a different word, but it has the same idea of rest. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It reads this, Therefore, having been justified, declared righteous by faith, we have, everybody, peace with God. Think rest with God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the eternal glorious rest of God. Why? Because we have been justified, declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. We are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we hope in the glory of God. You enter into eternal rest by believing in Jesus Christ. And the warning in 65 AD is there's some people who are hanging around the church who know this, but they don't believe it. It's simply a warning to say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Not do you know about Him, but if you were to stand before God and say, the only basis of my eternal hope for eternal life is that Jesus Christ is my Savior and I trust in Him wholly to save my unholy life. That's rest. Do you have that? You can't work to get it. It's faith to get it. And then there's a really interesting play on words that begins in verse 11. Verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter rest. It's an interesting phraseology. Work hard to rest in Jesus Christ alone, that none may fall by the same sort of disobedience as the wilderness rebellious generation who knew this stuff, knew this stuff, knew this stuff, but didn't believe in God. I don't know how to lean in any harder in 2021 looking at you and saying, like, this is not play, spiritual stuff. This is real spiritual stuff. It's not enough to know who Jesus is. It's that you personally, I personally have to say to Jesus, I trust you to save me. I believe the good news that came, and I trust in you. I, I don't want you to fall by the same sort of disobedience. And then there's this switch that goes to verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why this? Because the whole theme of Hebrews from the opening verse is God spoke. In many times, in many ways, through the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoke how? Through His Son, God spoke. This is the Word of God. 
And what the writer is unfolding is this truth about Jesus is God's revealed word. And if it's coming to you today, it's coming because the word of God, which is all that God did and included in his word, is living and active. It's energetic. It's powerful. It's not a dead book. It's a living book. Would you agree? It's like when you turn to the Word of God and you open it, it's able to go to places in you that you never thought possible. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can get to the very depths of the inside of you. And when suddenly, sometime when you're in church and you hear the Word being preached, and you know like, whoa, I'm opened up to God. Something about the way my motives are. Aren't motives a, a really tricky thing? And the Word of God is able to discern all of that, every thought and intention. It is, has vitality to it, that it can come and help us understand not only God, but we understand a little bit about ourselves. Someone said that we read the Scripture, and the Scripture reads us. And it sort of untangles in our hearts the emotions and unearths sort of the um, motivations and the intentions and the sins of our heart like nothing else can do. The Word of God is a scalpel that God uses to get to the very depths of our being and to reveal where we are right with God and where we are outside of that. And it is the power to do that because it's the living Word of God. And verse 13 says... No creature is hidden from his sight. We're all naked and exposed to his eyes, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Remember I said it was a warning passage? So this is where we would insert fire and brimstone. And we just say all of us are going to stand before God. And this is one of the lies of the enemy of our day that we're just going to live a happy life and then we're going to die and then it's all going to be over. You, you uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you'll die, and that's the end of it. Or if you do die, what happens to you when you die? You become an angel. No, you don't. Or you go sit on a crescent moon. No, you don't. You stand before God. We stand before God. And this, this truth about God... No creature is hidden from his sight. How frightening is that? We're all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. How frightening is that? Do you get what's happening here? There was a word about creation, God resting from creation. You see the connection here? Where, where was naked and not ashamed? In the Garden of Eden. Before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve were naked before God and no shame. We can't even fathom that. But here's a man and a woman that God created. They're walking with Him in beautiful harmony. They could have rest in the most beautiful sense of the word. They were naked. They were unashamed before God. And then sin came, and we all have shame. And guess who demolishes shame and guilt? Jesus Christ, who gave His life to forgive you of your sins and to bring you into relationship with God so that you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want you to miss this rest. It's not enough that you know it. It's not enough that I have it in my head. I must believe in Jesus Christ to experience that rest. How do you get it? It's the Word of God that's going to lead me to it. It's the Word of God that's going to help me know who God is and that He knows everything about us. And the Scriptures are there to guide us away from a wilderness generation so that when we hear the Word of God, what do we know? Jesus said, if you really are my disciples, you shall know, you shall abide in my Word and you'll prove yourself to be my disciples if you abide in the Word, and you will know the 
truth and the truth will set you free. You sang songs this morning. When you sang songs this morning, you said, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Sometimes you have to sing that to yourself. Because what I want to believe is that I'm a guilty, worthless, lost sinner, which I was, but He saved me by His grace, and now I'm at rest with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that. I believe that. Do you? The lights are flashing because it's called today, and we don't know what we have tomorrow. We don't know how long you have. I know you're young. You've got a long way ahead of you, but you don't know that you're going to make it all the way to my age or beyond. You don't know. So today, while it's today, what should I do? Do not harden my heart, but believe the good news that God wants us to enter into peace through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I want to call you to do that. I want to call you to trust in Jesus Christ, who said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you... Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Not just rest from what you have going on tomorrow, but a rest in which he gives his eternal self to you. He is the Sabbath one so that all your working comes to an end before God and you rest in Him with all your heart. Do you believe that? That is the most important question you will answer today and all the days of your life. Do you trust in Christ? Let's pray together. Father, I thank You that You offer a rest And when we look to Christ, we look to you to be the one who gives a rest from all our striving, all our self-efforts to be approved, to give freedom and release from all our failures. And I thank you that you give us a glimpse of a generation who failed so that we might not. And I pray for every person in the room today, maybe some who are actually asking today, do I really believe that Jesus Christ is the one who forgives sins and gives eternal life and rest? And I pray that you will awaken faith so that we would believe with all of our heart and rest in Christ for eternal rest. Lord, you're able to be the one through your powerful word who can awaken faith in our hearts. Your Word is living and active. So right now I pray that you will get into the darkest parts of our soul where our motives are deceitful and tricky and tangled, and I pray that you will just sort them out and bring us to bow before you with a kind of humble faith that says, Jesus Christ, be the one I think about, be the one I trust in, be the one that I consider first for my today and my tomorrow and my eternity. And I pray, Lord, to just awaken hearts to trust in you to be saved today and forever. That's what we pray for because you're the one, you're the only one. There's no other word coming that can save us but this word about Christ, this good news. So be our vision, Lord. Be the one we think about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.